So good morning, everybody. I am so excited. We have at least 103 people on this uh, uh, workshop today, which is fabulous. Uh, we, we were so excited. We've been sharing the numbers with our colleagues for days, and each day it just keeps increasing. So we are really excited to have you here today. If you don't know who I am, my name's Lisa Winter, and I'm the Compliance Administrator, Title IX Coordinator for Santa Monica College. With me uh, are my colleagues, um, Alan Kuykendall, who you probably have been emailing, and he has been admitting you. He is on my, he's on my left, um, top of the screen. And my other colleague is Linda Subius. Uh, the three of us have been working since last year to pull this together to get this going. So we are so excited to see everybody today. Just a very brief outline of what we are going to pack into a very short period of time. Uh, this, this session is focusing on Title IX, but you may be more familiar with the terms of Title IX as sexual assault or domestic violence or dating violence or, or rape. The, the aim and the purpose is to learn more about Title IX, particularly as we're in a remote environment issues relating to sexual assault, domestic violence, sadly, is on the increase rather than decrease, even by the fact that we're not being able to, to go to school or go to physically to work. And coming to school, for many of you, was your safe place. And some of you may not have that now. The reason why we wanted to host this session is because of our students. Students are telling us, um, and you will experience it yourself, that they're the ones that your friends come to to tell you about an incident uh, that may have happened to them uh, at some stage. And so knowing that you're the first person they trust, we wanted to reach out to students so that we could give you the tools so that you would know what to do, give you the support in case something happens to you. So the focus for today is twofold. Explain the program and what it's about and, and the expectations to allow um, and introduce one of our students who was a graduate of the program, and then a panel discussion with experts in their field at Santa Monica College to talk about what, who you can go to at SMC should something happen to you. And, the, and those panel members are with us today. I will say who they are very briefly, but when we get to that session, they will certainly say a lot more and introduce themselves more fully. But we do have Chief Johnny Adams, we also have Danilo Donoso, who comes from the Center of Wellness and Wellbeing. We have Juliana Carranza, who is the case manager for the care and prevention team. And we have Yvonne Ortega from the Ombuds office. And just so that you can see her, we have Yanvi Rakesh, who is a student graduate from our Title IX leadership program in 2019. So just some housekeeping. Um, Linda and Alan are going to manage the chat room. If there are things that you want to say, they will respond to that. We, we ask that if you do want to ask questions, you do it through chat, or if you put your hand up, either Alan or Linda will, will follow up with you and unmute you to ask your question. This is a safe place. I want to re-emphasize that. And so I want everybody to feel extremely comfortable and the expectation that we have is that we will have respect from and to everybody in this session today. So if there are, no, uh, and if I've forgotten anything at this point, Alan, Linda, please jump in. But if there's nothing else, I'm going to move towards sharing my screen to talk a little bit about the Title IX Leadership Program. And if you bear with me, uh, can you see that? Uh-huh. Right. Actually, almost there. Yes. Um, bear with me. My head's going to be turned just a little bit as I read uh, the second screen. So the leadership program, when we introduced this last year, what was really important for us, and, and, and it's noted here in, in the first slide, is that to be recognised as a student leader in the SMC community on issues related to sexual assault. And I wanted to say something about being a leader. Uh, you, you, you may well be, and I haven't seen all the people who are on the call today, 
you may well be a leader at SMC for the positions you hold, whether it's with uh, um, the associated students or, or with a, a, another group. You also may be a leader in your own community, but also by the strength of your conviction and your personality, um, you may be the person who you are as, as a leader and you want to, to do something, understand more and to give back. So I wanted to, to emphasize that as a starting point. Okay. All right. Okay, so what is this program about? This program will educate you and empower you and others and students about consent, sexual assault, sexual battery, healthy relationships, stalking, domestic and dating violence, and intersectionality uh, involving the LGBTQ plus community and other marginalized populations, including uh, black students, Latinx students, Pacific Islander students. One of the things that's really important for, for us to note that the issues that we experience may be very different because of our background and who we are, and we want to acknowledge that and recognize that. The, if you want, to be part of this program, then you are committing to coming to the workshops that will be next week and the following week. And I wanted to give you an outline of both of those, um, those, those days. Next Friday are workshops one and two. The first workshop will be on preventing sexual assault, how to create a culture of consent and respect. This workshop will be presented by someone from the Santa Monica Rape Treatment Center. And this will talk about understanding affirmative consent and what it means. It is the overview and and uh, overview and total explanation and introduction into issues relating to sexual assault. The following workshops and, and number two uh, as well will be more detailed and defined on what we want to, to share with you. So workshop two will be, is called Healthy Relationships, Consent is a Man's Issue too, for two reasons. Men are survivors and victims of sexual assault, and sometimes we forget that. But we also want to, to make men and everybody know that this isn't something that is, is a one person, a one gender, a one, a one race issue. This is something that we all need to be involved in and we all need to be committed to. The presenter for that workshop is going to be a representative from Peace Over Violence. They're also very similar to the Rape Treatment Centre that they have uh, services for survivors of sexual assault. But the Rape Treatment Centre in particular will be able to give you, uh, uh, what, what's the word I want? Uh, if, if you needed to go to them because you are assaulted, they will, they will treat you and give you medical care, is what I wanted to say. On Friday the 25th is, are, the, are workshops three and four. Workshop three is on domestic dating violence and stalking. The Centre for the Pacific Asian Family will be presenting that workshop. And for those of you that don't know that organisation, they focus on individuals from the Pacific and Asian area. The reason we really do work well with them is because of our international students, but also that they have uh, advisors there uh, and speak over 30 different languages. So sometimes if English is not your first language and it could be an issue, then they will certainly have advocates that can translate for you and that you can speak with. The final workshop, is intersectionality issues, LGBTQ and other marginalized populations. And BN Star, another organization that again focuses on um, people from marginalized groups, particularly Latinx individuals, again provide support in the area of sexual assault, um, rape, uh, and other issues related to Title IX. On Tuesday, October the 6th, for those of you that complete the program, and I will talk about what the criteria is in the later slide, you will be recognised at a Board of Trustees meeting. So on October the 6th, there will be a reception. It'll be a, a virtual party with the graduates, 
with the, the SMC staff who, for example, are here today, um, our guest presenters from the Rake Treatment Centre, uh, uh, Bianna Star, etc., will be invited. This is where you will share your ideas and plans as a Title IX leader to us. Um, and once we get in the, into the program, I'll share more details about that. And that is information that I then share with the Board of Trustees. There will be a presentation ceremony at the Board of Trustees meeting. And at that meeting, you will be awarded a certificate that will be signed by the, the Board of Trustees Chair and the Superintendent President, Dr. Jeffrey. So for those of you that are thinking now, this is what I'd like to do. Please make sure you keep October the 6th. It'll be in the afternoon, early evening. Um, uh, save the date in your calendars. So what will you gain from this program? You will become a leader and a role model and a, a leader in many different ways. A leader because you will have information that you can share or a leader because you you, you want to do something and you want to find a way to do that. You will learn more about social justice issues. It will improve um, public speaking skills when you do want to talk about these things because you will learn to share. You will find it easier to start a conversation um, and your own initiative. And sometimes that's the hardest thing. Um, you will join other SMC peer educators in being able to be comfortable sharing that message across the college. And certainly the last point, but, but no least, we do know that there are universities that have programs like this that have very active groups on campus. And if you complete this program, then this is something that you can add to your resume to strengthen your application, to show what you've done at SMC, um, to get into the university of your choice. We know university is extremely competitive and we know that this is something, for example, UCLA really do support. And, and certainly I know Johnny, um, excuse me, Chief Adams can attest to that as well. All right, so if you're committed, what do you have to do? S sign up today. Now, what I mean by signing up today is uh, I, I believe, Alan, we're going to have a poll at the end and if people are saying, yes, this is something that I can do, it's something that I'm interested in following through with, then yes, um, that's, this is for you. But having said that, each of these workshops are standalone. So you can come to these anyway, even if you don't want to commit to the program as a whole, but you have to attend everything if you want to get uh, recognized as a Title IX leader. So often people will say, so I'd like to do this, but what if I can't come to everything? Um, will I be able to complete the program? The answer is yes. We do have some training. It's called Not Anymore. It is really very good training. It's online training. And if you communicate with us and say, I can come to this, I can't come to that, we will send you that information so you can do that. If you are committed, then put the dates that we've just mentioned into your calendar. And obviously stay for the panel discussion so that uh, you, know, you can find out a bit more. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because the next bit that I wanted to cover was to introduce Yanvi. Let her talk about her experiences with the program and then give you an opportunity to ask her questions. So let me stop sharing. Hi, right. so Yanvi. Over to you. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm John V. I'm going to start off by telling you why I joined and my experience joining because the first program, I think we were 20 of us with one boy, which was, I'm really glad to have guys here because I think it's like a really big improvement from last time. So I was a part of AS, which is Associated Students, and I worked under the Director for Student Advocacy. So I kind of attended the orientation as a job, you could say. And I really, you know, I decided I wanted to stay. So I went for all four workshops. Um, I can give you a rundown. The first one, I believe, is one of the most important ones in a legal standpoint, because I'm an international student. I do not know the laws here and what counts. So I think that was, the, you know, really important for me. But the best workshop for me was the second one, which was uh, I have to ask Lisa, is it Rashad Beal who's going to be presenting again? 
unfortunately he has left peace over oh, okay he became a parent and so he had yeah. focused on being a dad so we had a speaker called rashad who i was just referring to um you know he was a person of color he came from the navy he had been he was a survivor and I think that workshop really affected me because one statistic that not many people like to talk about is one in six men in this country has been sexually assaulted by the age of 18. So it's not after 18 or in their lifetime, but by the age of 18. And being in college as a male makes you five times more likely to be a victim. And I felt like that was something that, you know, we don't usually talk about. So once the program ended, I think I spoke to Lisa about it and we decided we wanted to hold a program at school to raise awareness on this issue. And it was a push and shove. I cannot tell you how many people were not okay with the narrative of male sexual assault being in the light, but we did hold an event. It was called No Shame November that um, we had um, a social worker from the city who actually dealt with these cases. Um, Mike, his name is Michael Jackson. That's some fact for you. Uh, he was here. We had two different nonprofits. Uh, one was Rashabi from Peaceful Violence, and I think someone from the Rape Center had come to give a talk about what happened, like male sexual assault and male suicide rate issues, and how it impacts a whole society in general. So that's where kind of my focus went after the Title IX workshop, because that was something that really spoke to me. Another thing that spoke to me was, I think, the intersectionality one, because uh, again, I said that I'm an, I'm an international student, I come from India. Um, this official statistic is a, a woman is raped every 15 minutes in India, and that's the official one, and the unofficial one's probably around 10 women every 15 minutes. But due to like cultural issues, not many people report it, and even if they do, a lot of the survivors are actually killed for reporting this stuff, because it's not really considered honorable to be a rape survivor. So, you know, this workshop really does round you up because it will, you know, give you a good perspective of things like LGBTQ stuff, uh, people who are not American, because as someone who isn't, you know, it's really hard to explain to uh, like Americans how cultural differences actually impact sexual assault issues because, you know, it is com a completely different ball game in different cultures. Especially. So I remember last workshop, we had someone from the Ivory Coast and I think hearing her perspective was really important. So I guess like if I have to give you guys a bit of advice is just share as like, I know it's really tough because there's a hundred people, we were like 40 kids in one conference room. So it was kind of like, you know, eating food and chilling out, but do share or talk because that's how you're going to learn the most. And now just to go from like, that's a personal perspective. Now going from a professional standpoint. So this is my last semester here at SMC. So I'm currently doing college apps. That's why I have, you know, dark circles, but anyway, I could write like three essays just based on this one workshop and my experience there, because it really rounds you up professionally. It gives you different perspectives to speak about. And for me, for example, I don't know, there's a school in Boston called Babson that's highly specialized in business. That's all they do. And, you know, I'm a finance major. They had a 1500 word essay just on one extracurricular. You know, the other essays were like, let's just say 500 words, but this was just on one extracurricular. So find something you're passionate about. And I think if you've already signed up for a Zoom session to talk about sexual assault, just, you know, something really sensitive, you guys are halfway there. So I would say, you, you know, go to the workshop, see what part of it's, you know, meets your niche, because not all of it's going to, you know, as someone who does not identify as a part of the LGBTQ uh, you know, community, I understood the stuff, but, you know, it was not something I could really relate to, because that's not where I come from. So find your niche and work on it, because, you know, everyone comes from a different background. And if you can use your background in this workshop to do something, then, you know, just go for it because A, it's going to make you a better person. B, it really helps in college apps. I'm not even kidding. So, I mean, that's my experience. If you guys have any questions, just hopefully I can read because the chat's kind of blowing up. But I will also, um, and I'm also a part of, like, I'm the student representative on the Title IX advisory board that the school has. So that's more of, I think, an administrative stuff where we have, few NGOs, school administrators, I'm the student representative. We, you know, it's, I think, four meetings 
a semester. I Lisa's gonna confirm that I'm I just attend with when I get the Zoom link. But, <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing you can do is just be a part of the bigger picture and the bigger change. So I will drop my email, like my student ID here. So if you guys do have any questions throughout the program or you know want my perspective on stuff, then you know. I'm also going to do that because I'm imagining not everyone wants to share their posts and questions on the chat. So, but if you guys have any questions for me right now, go ahead and ask, but that's my email address. I just typed it into the chat. Yeah, and I will mention, although we're recording this session, we will not be recording the workshops. So, yeah. um, you know, what, what is shared there, it will not, should not leave the session. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, I was going to ask if you were recording the workshops because the workshops is where you really get into like the trigger stuff and where you can really share and bond and make a network. You know, when I wanted to do my event, I cannot tell you how many people said no because most people don't imagine that males get sexually assaulted. And then we were at the homecoming game and there was no one except for like AS kids and stuff. And there were still three other graduates who had been to the workshop. And they were like, hey, you know, you had that idea. I was like, yeah, but no one wanted to do it. And then they said, we'll do it. And literally over a game of football, the sport, I do not understand at all. I call it hand deck because football for me is legs. Um, <laughs> you know, a whole event was planned. And I think it was a really good event because after that, we had so many people come to us and tell us that, hey, I don't even know this happens or this is something that can happen. So, you know, you use this as a networking thing, not just, you know, for professional gain, but you these experiences are really good because you'll meet people who are like-minded but really different. So mm -hmm. go for that. And if you guys have any questions, I'll answer them now. So Real quick, Lisa, um, and I, I see a lot of questions in the chat box regarding registration to make sure people are noted. So to everybody, following this meeting, either tomorrow or definitely by the end of next week, I'll be sending an email out to every email that's that is associated with this um, this work, this orientation, and to give you instructions on how to make sure that you're noted for this, um, this orientation. So uh, that should answer all those questions. Thank you, Ellen. Are there any questions for Janvi that uh, you can see through the chat that would be helpful for her to answer or for me to answer just at this point? Yeah, because I can tell you the student yeah. stuff, but if you ask me an administrator, I think I don't know and I don't get into it. Yeah, I'm not seeing um, questions so That's much okay. as an appreciation um, <laughs> that the program exists because it brings the awareness that these things really do happen. And I remember, you know, of course, I was involved in the program I had on set and was in all the workshops last year, and it was just profound yeah. how it impacted people because everybody either knew somebody or it happened to them or you know it really opened up your eyes about not only the frequency but how it happens and how to best talk to somebody that this has happened to you know one thing i feel is important is we're a commuter school obviously we don't have dorms or frat parties and stuff which is usually where this stuff happens i know it may not be appropriate to talk about that but because we're a commuter school it makes you a bigger target because you don't have a centralized system, you know, for support. But the thing is, we do. We really have a good support system and, a, you know, chain of command, which I think you'll find out today, of how to, you know, report this stuff. Even if it's happened off campus, trust me, there's resources on campus to really help you out with this. So I guess that's really important to realize is us being the, you know, structure we are as a community college you feel like you may not have that support, but you really do and everything's lined up with this stuff. I think, you know, when Chief Adams and all speak, you realize we had everything, just know it and share it. That's the one thing I understood. So, yeah. And I've dropped my email. If you guys have any personal questions, go ahead and just email me because I get the chats kind of like a hundred people. You don't want to talk about it. So, all right, that's me. <laughs> John V. I think John V said it so much better than I did uh, on talking about this program and she's given us a really fabulous segue into the next section. Um, but one thing I did want to, to, to say as well is that even though people share uh, during our workshops, you don't have to share. And these workshops aren't just for people 
who are survivors, what we found is that when people trusted the group and, and were comfortable, they shared stories. And so I don't want you to think, well, I'm, this, this isn't for me because I won't have, my story won't be important enough. Everybody, whoever you are, your experiences are, are, are validated and we want you to be part of this group. Uh, and if it can create a network that can work after the sessions are over, then that, that's fabulous. So now I'm gonna segue into the next part of the program, which is our, our panel discussion. And thank you in advance to the four people who are here today, who have volunteered their time to, sh to share what support there is here at Santa Monica College. Because I know students still don't know who to go to or why I should go to that person or what can that, what that, can that office offer me? Uh, and then they don't do something. Uh, and yet we have all of these people here who are willing to, to help uh, some, um, no, all above and beyond um, a nine to five type schedule. So I'm gonna start with Chief Adams. Um, I'm gonna let you talk. And you know, if you have questions as through his short presentation, then we'll, uh, you know, he'll answer those. And then I'm going to move on to Danilo. So the, just that you know the order. Then I'm going to move to Juliana. And then I'm going to go to Eva, just so that you know when you're coming up. OK, so hello, everyone. I'm uh, Chief Johnny Adams. I've been at SMC for about four and a half years. So, uh, But I've worked in the educational system for over 35 years. Uh, I'm a retired police captain from UCLA. I worked there for 29 and a half years. Uh, after I left there, I, I went across town, uh, even though I'm a total Bruin, I just have to put that out there. I went to USC and I was their deputy chief for two and a half years. Uh, and then I came here. So uh, I, I've worked in this environment for my entire career. Uh, and uh, I think it's really important to note when we talk about support, um, since I've been doing this so long, as well as the fact that uh, I'm also the uh, past president of the FBI National Academy, I pretty much know every chief of police in the county of Los Angeles and, and pretty much a lot of the different uh, chiefs and, and high executive level people all throughout the country uh, to assist with, with anything that may happen on this. Our agency is unique, especially at a community college because uh, when somebody is reporting to uh, the police, we're mandatory reporters. So if you come to the police department, we have to be mandatory reporters in the sense of working with you to, uh, I guess, deal with the crime. We work also with the different resources on campus to make sure that uh, you're connected. But one of our approaches that's uh, quite different is we wanna share that we don't want to know your name off, off the bat, right? Because if we don't know your name, then you know, even though we have to mandatorily report the statistic, you know, we don't have to move forward with a lot of different things when it comes to uh, uh, sharing the information. So uh, I think that's really important to note. So many of our officers, what they'll do is they'll, they'll hear it out and give you these options because if you wanna report it and to be investigated, then we will go ahead and match you up with resources. Our department has a lot of what's called MOUs or memorandums of understanding. Many of the crimes, because we're a community college, do occur off campus. I, since I've been here for four and a half years, uh, I think all of our crimes, uh, for the most part, the ones that we do investigate are sexual batteries. It's when an individual touches the intimate part of another individual. And those are the type of things that happen on campus, very rare, but they do occur. Uh, the sexual assaults uh, that occur outside the campus, we do work with you. Uh, we're kind of like an advocate in a sense, uh, where we'll, connect you with the proper department, uh, will help to transport you to, if this happened within 72 hours, to the to Santa Monica Rape Treatment Center, uh, and they will do the same thing. One of the things that I wanna share with Santa Monica Rape Treatment Center, they're not here on this call, but they're also a mandatory reporter. And the way that they work things out is they'll call the local agency, and if you don't wanna give your name out, it's really important to know, they're, they're probably gonna use your first name, and then your last name's gonna be Doe. Like, you know, how they have Jane Doe, John Doe, things like that. And the reason why they do that is to keep your confidential uh, record in place. But also at the same time, because criminal cases are very um, unique and also uh, very difficult uh, to go through in, in a lot of ways because 
physical evidence is really important. When someone goes there, they, they keep all the information, they take the report, they have all the information, and you may not want to move forward with prosecution. And that's why you gave the name Jane Doe, right? But then let's say eight days later, two years later, you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna report this. And I think that's really important um, because I'll share a story with you. Uh, I think you may not remember it because it, it was about 10 years ago, but at UCLA, they had a water polo player who had sexually assaulted uh, a, one of our co-eds there. And uh, we felt we had enough to bring uh, criminal charges against him. Uh, we went forward to the district attorney's office and they said it was, you know, basically he said, she said it was very difficult to prove and they didn't file the case. Uh, the water polo player then went on the uh, aggress, you know, got very aggressive in his PR because he was trying to clear his name. And, and so he started, you know, he was in the news and all kinds of stuff. Well, then that prompted another four victims to come forward. And when they came forward, we were able to present the case again with those four individuals. Now we had five survivors and he was convicted and uh, you know, it was, it was filed on, he was convicted and everything. And some of the evidence was actually, we didn't even know about, they had gone to the rape treatment center and had filed it as a, a Jane Doe you know, type thing. And, but they had all of that evidence there to prove that case and to really make it uh, a solid case for them. So that's one of the things. I'm gonna share my screen real quick, if you don't mind. Um, one of the things that I do wanna share is we have a safety app here at Santa Monica College. It's called Live Safe, and it's something that I think it's really important uh, that you download and share with other students. Right now, you'll see this command dashboard. So basically, this is what my dispatchers see on the left-hand side. And then what you'll see is the mobile app is on the right-hand side. On there, it has reporting tips, emergency options, safety map, and then also, uh, it says go safe here because this is the generic, but it's actually safe walk. Up on the left-hand side, you see how it has this drop-down menu? This is where a lot of information is that's really important for our students, and I'll go over that. It's easily downloadable. This is kind of what it looks like if you go to the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. And then here's what it would look like if you were to have it here at SMC. Um, I think it's really important because when you click on one of these options, let's say emergency options, it gives you three options. You can call 911, and I wanna share this with you so you understand this. So, here at SMC, uh, our communication center, the only 911 calls that will go to the SMC police will be those that come from a campus phone. If you dial from your cell phone, it will go to the local agency. So if you're at the Bundy campus, it'll go to LAPD. Uh, and if it's over at, you know, here on campus uh, or any of the other satellite campuses, it'd go to Santa Monica PD. So that's something that's very unique and important. Uh, you'll also see here that it says call SMCPD. That's so you don't have to memorize our number and then message us. The thing I like about the messaging is it's, it's an ability for you to document things. You're able to go ahead and talk, uh, you know, candidly with people. And then we have a record of it uh, in that way. This is what it looks like when you're actually texting. You actually could uh, uh, attach a photo, a video, or an audio. And then also we have a safety map. So it kind of tells where you may be, you know, in case you're having an emergency. So if it's actually happening right then and there, we know if you drop the line exactly where you're at to send the officers to go ahead and protect you. Uh, there's a safe walk as well. I know that um, it's, it's really important. Some people may be walking late at night and um, you want to be able to invite a friend so they can watch you walk. This, this works anywhere. So it's not just on campus. You could be at your home and let's say, or work, and you want somebody to watch you walk to the parking lot because you don't feel comfortable at night. They can do that as well. And then they'll know the GPS location so they can tell the police if anything does happen. Here's the important part on the drop down menu. I think a lot of times we're going to give you a lot of information and you're just going to go, well, that's just way too much. It's, it's, it's overload. So here on the app, we actually have many things where we have sexual assault assistance. We actually have many of the resources that are there. As you can see, there's the Title IX coordinator, there's campus safety, there's support and advocate groups. We have local counseling uh, um, at, that are confidential that are off campus. We have national, uh, I guess counseling centers as well and local police department numbers. So it's a lot of information, but it's right there at your fingertips. And I think that's really important. So I'll stop sharing the screen. The other thing that I just wanted to share real fast with you is um, 
we've worked with a lot of students to get restraining orders. Uh, I, I, I think it's a difficult thing to go through that. It's a lot of paperwork. I mean, it's literally, you know, seven to eight pages and like five or six different documents. Uh, we've done this before, so we're, we work with you on that uh, and then help to get you to the location. Uh, if you do decide to report it criminally, you know, we will work with you with that particular agency. Uh, and we've had times when some of the other agencies, they may, um, not work uh, as fast, maybe because their caseload is a lot higher. I'm not going to name those agencies, but they're much larger agencies than ours. And uh, sometimes those cases actually, it's almost as if they get lost. And we've had to prompt uh, investigators, call supervisors, call all kinds of people. I've even called the deputy chief one time on one of our cases to get it to be moved forward because you know, it seemed like we were just waiting forever to get some information and to find out updates and our survivor wasn't getting updated by the detective. And I think that's very important that we have that, that communication with your, your investigating officer because you know, you're waiting and you don't know what's going on and you don't understand the process. Uh, our agency will help you and, and I always offer this and I'll put it in chat a little later, my, not only my email, but my, my cell phone number. Uh, I take the uh, calls 24 hours a day uh, in fact, uh, I know that for a fact because, um, you know, I got a call when I was in India, actually for a conference in India, and it was 3 a.m. Uh, India time. And, uh, you know, I answered the phone. And it was somebody here at SMC who was, it was daylight for you guys, I guess, and wanted to share something. And we ended up talking for a couple hours. So I think it's just really important that we, you know, that I'll answer it. The one thing I will share with you on that is if, um, I can't answer right away. It may be because I'm in a meeting. So if you're on a cell phone, I'll text back and say, hey, is this really important? And if not, I'll call you back as soon as the meeting's over with. Uh, and so I'll get back to you as soon as I can on that. One of the things that I, I think is really important on our end is that we, we communicate and we walk you through the events. It it's, can be very traumatic. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've helped to take people to court. Uh, we've helped to take them to different areas, to resources and stuff, because we think it's very important. Um, I think it's, you know, it's impacted me quite a bit because when I was at UCLA, I actually investigated uh, sexual assaults. And uh, my first sexual assault was one where it's very difficult, but we caught him and he ended up getting four years for uh, attempt rape. Uh, it was very difficult because, um, he was actually uh, a neighbor in the dorms and uh, they were friends and he had a girlfriend and everything, but he was just enamored by this girl. And one day he actually pre-planned everything, uh, saw the roommates down in the uh, cafeteria and found out she was alone and went up there and, and had a knife to her neck. And, and, you know, uh, since he made so much noise, the neighbor next door called her and it startled him and he ran away and we were able to catch him and then uh, take him to jail. But it impacted me a lot talking to her about this whole incident because it was a friend, you know, and it was not just, you know, something where drugs or alcohol were involved, like at a frat party. This was, you know, totally so sober, another student. And I know we trust, you know, other students all the time. And so, um, we're there for you and I'll go ahead and put my information in the chat. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll go ahead and start answering. Hey, somebody uh, had on the chat box um, the, the, on the app where it says the counseling, they're asking what kind of counseling it is, you know. Uh, they're going to have a, different kinds of counseling in there. So basically you'll have access to the numbers for uh, the uh, wellness and well-being center, it will have other outside counts, uh, counseling centers as well. It has the 24 hour hotlines for, you know, suicide, uh, things like that. They have a national hotline as well. So there's quite a few different resources there. We're opening to changing, you know, so if you find a student, there's somebody that's very good at, at helping uh, our students and you know about it, you know, share it with me. We'll talk to the app developers and we'll add that to one of the, the drop downs as well. Does anybody else have any questions for Chief Adams? 
And I just want to say, you know, my cell phone's there. So I know a lot of people don't want to share or talk about a lot of things that are on there. If you want to talk privately, you know, feel free to call me. Uh, and, and, you know, I will say, don't tell me your name you know, right off the bat, you know, uh, unless you feel comfortable and you want this to go criminally, you know, and just say, hey, I want to bounce something off of you. I've had a lot of students that have done that in the past, just saying, well, hypothetically, what if this? And I try to give them as much advice as I can. Okay. So I put that in there. So the num for the questions for Chief Adams, and thank you so much. They may be as we keep moving through. I'm going to ask um, um, Danilo Donoso, who is with the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing, to take the floor. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And so many, I didn't know there were so many great features on that Live Safe app. Can't recommend that enough. It's really a great thing to download. So I'm Danilo Donoso, and I'm a full-time licensed psychologist at the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing, and this is my third year here at SMC. And our office, the Center for Wellness, consists of two full-time psychologists, and that includes Dr. Allison Brown and myself, one newly hired part-time licensed clinical social worker, and two post-grad interns, and uh, we're welcoming this year two social work interns. So at the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing, our mission is to enhance the overall personal well-being of SMC students, and we assist students who may be frightened and scared as a result of trauma by providing short-term and confidential therapy and counseling services. So what does this mean? This means that when a student meets with one of our therapists, they will be provided with a supportive and empathic counseling session with the goal of listening and understanding in a supportive non-judgmental manner and just try to develop with the student the best treatment options available for them. And if during the session we learn that another SMC student, staff, or employee is responsible for, let's say, a sexual assault, rape, sexual harassment, and or stalking behavior, dating violence, we will inform the student of the uh, services that Title IX can offer and how to contact Title IX and provide information regarding campus police and information about how they can also be an excellent resource in keeping a student survivor safe, as you just heard from Chief Johnny. So another important aspect of our work at the Center for Wellness are the resources we provide. The great thing about Santa Monica and West Los Angeles are the many quality longer term resources available to survivors such as ECF, the Exceptional Children's Foundation, which serves our TAY or transitional aged youth population who have Medi-Cal or LA Care. And of course, there's the Rape Treatment Center, which provides free longer term therapy for survivors. Edelman Westside Mental Health, Dee Dee Hirsch, Family Services of Santa Monica, this just to name a few. So bottom line, whether the student survivor has money or not, insurance or not, we will get them connected to longer term treatment if this is what the student survivor thinks would be best for them at the time. And since our services are confidential, we cannot break confidentiality by reporting the abuse or assault a student may have endured unless the student provides us with written authorization to do so. And we will never pressure the student to allow us to break confidentiality. We will not pressure the student to contact Title IX or anyone else we only want to assist in exploring the options that might be most helpful and answer any questions the student may have. Most importantly, our role is to be a trusted and confidential source of support. Um, we also, we do work with different departments. We provide referrals to various departments on campus, depending on the student's needs. We also provide consultation, we conduct workshops. I have three now on our YouTube channel. Please check them out. One is on stress management. Another is on the benefits of meditation and mindfulness, and uh, a new one we just added on building social confidence. Uh, Dr. Allison Brown and I attend care and prevention team meetings to help support students who may be of concern. So there's a lot of interdepartmental collaboration and communication between the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing and other departments around campus and um, outside agencies. And lastly, if you experienced sexual assault, rape, attempted rape, stalking, DV, or domestic violence, or dating violence, please get help. And you could start by calling us or sending us an email, um, cww at smc.edu. You can also call us, 310-434-4503. Of course, we're providing 
counseling and therapy remotely. Um, and one last thing I also want to say before passing the baton is that if you would prefer meeting with a female therapist, I and the only other male therapist in our office right now, our postdoc intern Eugene, will not take it at all personally, completely understandable. Just let us know and we will be more than happy to accommodate you without hesitations. And Nilo, along those lines, we have a yes. question about whether you have any um, African American, any black um, counselors. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We have Thea Winkler and we just hired um, Marcy Pollard, who will be, his, she is a licensed clinical social worker and she will be working out of our office part time. We have a, a John V wanted to share something. I'm going to unmute John V. I'm just going to chime in here for a second. Um, if anyone's an international student, you know our health insurance is provided by the school. So the school offers short-term therapy, but when you, if you, you need feel the need to switch to a long-term therapist, it's covered in the insurance at a pretty low cost. Like your copay is still going to be like 20 bucks or even lower than that. So, I mean, that's just, if any of you are international, that's just additional information that our health insurance covers it. So, you know, don't think twice about it because I know that's a concern for all of us. So, yeah. That's a great, that's a great point, John B. I just want to point out there, there is no longer a copay. So it's yeah. not 25, 10, 5, it's, it's nothing. So, yeah, if you're international, you know us in insurances by the school. So just make sure we're good to go. Don't worry about that. As long as you get a referral, you're good to go. So we have a question, um, first of all, whether there's any Spanish speaking counselors and also whether um, people are talking about the YouTube channel, what's the name of it? Is yes, the the, um, it's the, it's, it's on the, it's affiliated with the Santa Monica College YouTube channel. So just look at that. It's under health and wellness. Um, it's really easy to find. And there are Spanish speaking clinicians. Um, there is Kimberly Rios Lamb who works out of STEM and EOPS. In our office specifically, Marlene Ruiz is a Spanish speaking therapist and she is awesome. Yes, and I see that Nara um, put the link to the YouTube channel on the chat box. Thank so you thank so you much. Thank you very much. Oh, and so did, oh, we also, Ellen also posted some resources. Any other questions? And Kimberly, um, we also, uh, I think we, he answered that, that yes, uh, there are black counselors. Yes. The other thing too, um, and thank you so much, Nilo, is there is a 24 seven um, number that if you can't reach anybody, uh, during the regular business hours, then you can call that number. Um, Danilo, can you put that in the chat box? Um, absolutely. So that people can note it down? I, I yeah, guess. absolutely. So, because we often know that things don't happen at, you know, 11 a.m. in the morning, they'll happen at 2 a.m. in the morning um, or 1 a.m. And that's when you perhaps do need to speak to somebody and you're wondering, who could that be? So we want to let you know, apart from calling Chief Johnny, um, you know, you can call also this 24-7 hotline number. Yes, and Amelia chimed in and said that the Black Collegians Program also has Black um, counselors um, for any issues that come up, and Adelante as well. Um, they recommend okay. Patty Del Valle. So we do have resources. So, so thank you. Uh, and plus, I, I, I'd like to also just plug that the college is going to be opening up a student equity centre. I, I can see that some um, of the students here are familiar with this because you're involved. The student equity centre will also not necessarily be providing counsellors such as um, uh, Adelante and Black Collegians, but there will be people there who understand the issues. There will also be a pride centre so that for our LGBTQ community, um, who often feel that, you know, there are no services for them. We are working really hard to make sure that the Student Equity Centre will have individuals and services and contacts available uh, for, for all students um, so that you feel supported at SMC. And if you wanted to ask some more questions about that, 
at the end, then I'm certainly very comfortable to, to answer those. And any student who is who on, on this uh, meeting today, if you're also part of the Student Equity Centre, then please, um, your voice is, is uh, welcome to, to share as well. So at this point, I'm going to go to Juliana Carranza, who is our uh, case manager for the care, sorry, yeah, Juliana Carranza is our case manager for the care prevention team. Hi everyone, good to see you all. Um, I think I might be the newest person here. It'll be a year next week that I've been at SMC, so I still consider myself a newbie. Still learning about um, all the great things that SMC does. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what I do in my role at SMC. Um, I'm the case management coordinator for the care and prevention team. Um, and the care and prevention team was created several years ago um, it started off very small and then slowly grew and, and the original purpose was really to focus on uh, campus safety and addressing and hopefully preventing any crises that could come up in, on campus. Um, from then it has really developed into not just addressing crises but also again, trying to do more prevention work and more care. Um, and so from crisis prevention to really care and prevention of how can we provide, you know, the resources and support services that students might be needing um, to hopefully prevent things from escalating for becoming crises and just to help our students be, be um, well and to be successful at SMC. So um, I'm going to review a little I'm going to look at a, another website so I don't miss anyone. The team consists of various people throughout the um, college campus. Um, and what I have really appreciated about the team is that it, it's basically a multidisciplinary team. So there are um, different people from the campus that are basically representing their, their department or their office, and they all get to kind of offer their opinion or speak on from their point of view, how we might be able to best support either one student in particular or just the student, um, the college community in general. So everyone kind of gets, gets, gives their input and insight. Um, and so the people that are on that team are um, our chief of police, Johnny Adams, uh, student judicial affairs, which is handles um, conduct violations um, from students. And then um, the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing. So Danilo is also part of our team as well as Allison Brown. Um, Health Services Center is part of our team. Ombud, so Yvonne, who you'll hear from later today. Um, our count academic counseling, Department is also part of the team, the Center for Students with Disabilities, the International Education Center, Academic Affairs, um, Human Resources and Title IX. So Lisa Winter is a big, big part of our team um, and our legal campus legal counsel and then myself. So the way it kind of works is um, when there is a student that is maybe going, going through some sort of difficulty or we're worried about them because of certain behaviors um, or certain things that they might be saying that just sound concerning, staff and faculty can submit a referral directly to the, the care and prevention team. Um, and then I get those referrals. I take a look at the, the, the incident that's being reported. I take a look at maybe the student's academic history, see, you know, are there patterns of this? Um, and the reasons for referrals really vary. Um, very, very greatly. So um, depending on the student's needs. So we get reports and referrals for students who are needing um, help with basic needs. So housing and food and, you know, right now that we're all dealing with with COVID, that's definitely been a, a, a hot topic, a hot, a, 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 a popular kind of reason for, for referral is people needing, needing help with, with their basic needs. Um, then we also get referrals for, for students that are wanting some mental health support and are maybe needing some guidance or some help in getting connected with a therapist. Um, students who are having academic issues and maybe they're, maybe they have, you know, they suspect to have a disability. They're not really sure what to do. We provide some guidance with that as well. And so I triage with the rest of the team to see, you know, where, where can we maybe refer the student a lot of times you know, SMC has a lot of services and, and resources. And I feel like even after a year, I'm still learning of, of all that, that we have. 
Um, but part of what we do is also collaborate and uh, communicate with a lot of outside agencies. So we also look at, you know, what are some community based agencies that we can either bring in or connect the students to, to make sure that they have the support that they need. So um, the other, you know, areas that are also very common for us to get reports are for situations of, of abuse um, and different types of abuse. So, you know, that would include like child abuse as well in certain cases, um, but in case, you know, situations of sexual assault, stalking, um, int intimate partner violence, domestic violence are all also part of the type of reports that we get at the care and prevention team. So I work very closely with Chief Adams and Lisa and, um, and the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing on how can we best support the student, you know, depending on, on, on the situation. And again, making sure that we're referring them to the appropriate places if, if they're needing additional support outside of the college. Um, I think one of the, the helpful things that I've, I've been able to work on with, with students who've experienced these things is being um, like an advocate on campus and a central point of contact where, um, you know, when, when, you, when you go through a traumatic situation, it, it's difficult to, to talk about or to think about and, and to even harder to want to talk about it with multiple people. So a lot of the students that I work with will say, well, I, I just, I don't want to tell my teacher. I've already told this, you know, two people. I don't want to tell 10 people. And so I work with the student on coming up with some sort of plan of like, how can we still communicate to your professor that you're needing some flexibility or that you're going to need an extension or you're, you're needing some support? Um, and how much are you willing to share? How much are you not? You know, and so we come up with a plan, something that the student feels comfortable with. Um, and then I, you know, I, I am able to communicate with the instructors to, to make sure that they're being supportive, make sure that they're being flexible, um, and that the student is getting what they, what they need. Um, yeah, I don't know, Dan Danilo and, and Chief Adams are also part of the team and, and Yvonne, so feel free to jump in. I, I don't know if I missed anything or if that kind of covers it. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, forgot to mention that. <laughs> I think I just mentioned that uh, if you go to the care and prevention team's website, there's a, a we call it a maxient report, but it's a way of reporting things. Uh, and you can report anonymously or uh, you can give out the information that goes to the entire team. And so we read it. And so uh, it's, it's really important. Uh, the only ones that I don't get are title nine, because then if I knew it right off the bat, then, um, uh, then I would have to do something, but uh if, if it's something that you want to share on the side, you can, but it does go to us. I mean, there are times when we have students that are in distress and as soon as we read it, we're on it and having welfare checks done and all kinds of stuff. So um, it's one resource that's out there as well. I don't know if, if we're opening it to questions for me or, or at the end for everyone. Now, if there are any questions for, for Juliana, um, please ask them now. If not, then I will introduce Yvonne Ortega. She works in the Ombuds Office and I will let her share who she is and what the Ombuds Office does. Okay, great. Now, of course, I just messed up my screen. All right, now I see you. Uh, so the ombuds, I don't know if anyone has heard of an ombuds person, but um, it actually is Swedish. Uh, so you can look at the history of it, but we serve as informal and confidential um, a service to students. But in our real world life, we are also faculty members. So there are three ombuds persons on campus and we have about 20 hours a week devoted to any issue a student is having on campus. It could be with faculty, it could be with another student, it could be with an administrator or staff. So what we, how we serve you is that we're listening ear first. So if you were to report an incident of sexual harassment or assault, we could 
listen to you, direct you where you should go on campus if you would like to pursue an, a formal process. So basically we're an informal, neutral, and confidential service. UCLA has a very large ombuds office. It um, probably has about 10 different ombuds because they serve undergrads, they serve graduate school, postdocs. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But I'll give you an example of how an ombuds office can serve in sexual assault. And probably the most recent was USC. So I actually went to USC. And USC had a gynecologist. This was in the paper, it was all over the news. And a gynecologist that was sexually assaulting students and um, was part, obviously, of the medical school. So throughout his time there, it was almost 30 years this gynecologist worked at USC. He assaulted several students, many people concerned to report him. It went on forever. And finally, someone stepped up, reported a lot of other female students reported him. So they had this class action suit that recently was settled, actually officially in January. Part of the suit wasn't just, you know, helping students or those victims get back um, what they've lost financially, so there, there was compensation, depending on the degree of assault. But one of the things that USC is now required to do is open up an ombuds office. So that was huge to see that USC did not have an ombuds in place. So why would that be different from going to HR or a counselor? Because it was actually scary for some students of USC to step forward and go to HR. Some of them were actually working on campus as well or working with the doctor. So they were fearful for how it would affect their employment or their status as, um, let's say, an intern. It's because the medical school is there as well. So no one was reporting this person because he had so much influence in the medical school. So the ombuds office could have been a place that a student could have gone or an employee of that clinic that he served and felt safe that it was confidential that we're not going to be part of the formal process. So the ombuds office um, is not a man mandated reporter, so we aren't required to uh, report an incident if it did occur on campus with student and faculty or staff. We don't have to report. We could listen to you. We can advise you, counsel you, um, and kind of point you in the right direction. So that's how we serve uh, sexual assault and work with our Title IX programs. Um, in general, the Ombuds Office serves in other ways. So grade concerns and like I said, uh, communication with faculty if you need assistance. So one of the things Juliana mentioned was her role as a case manager who can work with a faculty member, let's say you're part of the class, and this has impacted, obviously, um, your status in the class and your grades and your performance, an ombuds can also serve in that capacity. So we can reach out to the faculty member on your behalf and we can ask for some leniency, um, maybe extension of, of deadlines, whatever you need, um, what kind of support you need during this difficult time. So if you have, if you are a victim of sexual assault, we could help you communicate with faculty without disclosing any uh, confidential information. So um, once, you, once we give you any advice that we, you know, we, we mentioned Lisa Winters, a Title IX officer, we can definitely refer you to Danilo and the Center for Wellness and Wellbeing. So we can refer you um, to what we obviously would think benefit you, but they are, uh, mandatory, mandatory reporters, Title IX, and Chief Adams, as he mentioned, there's workarounds on how he can maintain some confidentiality, but we are 100% confidential. 
So the three ombuds that we have, uh, I'm in the life science department faculty member, also ombuds. And we have Sandra Hutchinson, who is also life science, also ombuds. And we have Paul Klump, who is philosophy and also ombuds. Uh, are there any questions for me? Great, thank you so much. And I'll definitely put my information in the chat as well. Thank you so much, uh, Yvonne. If there are any other general questions, then please, please ask them now, even if you think, well, I've missed my chance, I should have asked it, you know, 15 minutes ago, we can certainly keep opening it up. For the last few minutes of today, I wanted to just close this off. I put into the website the Title IX, or into, into the chat, the Title IX website. It's also, I don't call it Title IX, I call it sexual um, support, um, sexual support response and prevention, uh, because they're the things that, that we really do. I also um, want to share some resources with you. If you would like me to send you the PDF of these, then I will certainly get these to you. Um, if I share this, um, if you can see, this is a, a brochure that we have just updated uh, and it, it's titled sexual, uh, What is Sexual Assault? But it has on this side, outside resources that you can go to. I've, I've listed these because these ones are 24 seven and they are free. And if you feel that you would like to talk to someone outside of SMC and not at SMC, then these organizations and some I do know very well uh, are, offer really good resources. Another, another resource that we didn't talk of too much, I'll stop sharing my sheet. Um, screen now was Sojourn. Sojourn is specializes in domestic violence and this organization can assist uh, individuals in finding an alternative place to live uh, and assist in helping you continue with your education or even continue with your work. So these organizations are out there and they are just so understanding and supportive that you should feel comfortable, even if you just wanted to talk and just say, I want to find out a bit more about what you have to offer. <coughs> Excuse me. So at this point, I um, want to remind everybody about the next workshops, which will be next Friday, not Thursday. They will literally be back to back. Um, everybody, if you haven't seen uh, uh, the bulletin that's gone out and you don't know what times they are. Alan or Linda, if you could just find out and before we end today, just let people know what times um, these are on. But if you have registered already, you should have got a, <coughs> a calendar invite to know when these are on. Alan, you were going to do a poll. I don't know whether you still want to do that, but we have time for that. No, I didn't. We did not. I did not upload the poll this morning. That's okay. Um, I really do hope, uh, and this would be amazing, I, we had at least 124 people uh, on this presentation today and that, that is fabulous. I'm, I am hoping 124 of you do want to continue, but if not, please come to the workshops anyway. They, they're standalone. As Janvi said, um, some, some resonated with her so much you know and, and impacted her I, I we hope the same for you and certainly if you have suggestions for us that we can do things better uh, and or differently then we're certainly open to that put it in the chat or send send us an email and, and we will follow through uh linda you unmuted is there a question uh, yeah yeah, actually, somebody asked if there were academic counselors, if, if they themselves want to pursue a career related to sexual abuse prevention and treatment. Uh, you know, Danilo, can you answer that question? Uh, whether there are academic counselors um, to, I mean, uh, 
I, I think academic counselors can help with a variety of career options and choices. And if they don't know, they can definitely help guide and support that. But I don't know if there's specifically counselors that have training that can um, help gear you towards a career in that field. I think that um, I would recommend with the, our career center. So SMC has a career center and I don't remember what the full name of it is, but they have they have academic counselors within the career center that that's kind of their specialty is kind of like career employment exploration. So the, the, the one counselor might not have a specialty specifically with sexual assault, but that's kind of a large part of what they do is explore different career options and schools and things like that. So I, I check out the career center. Great question. Um, yeah, actually, um, after like, for example, I mentioned earlier, I'm a finance major, but I'm minoring in poli sci because I want to go into nonprofit work. So again, I would recommend go to the career service. I personally would, I go to Jenna, Jenna Gosman, because she's, you know, she's been a recruiter for people. So mm -hmm. that's, she, I would recommend going to her because she knows it. And mm -hmm. I would just, you know, go ask career services. They have a good thing for, you know, resume, figuring out what you want to do. Another thing is when you have transfer school, like if you know what transfer schools you want to go to, just email them saying, hey, this is my major and this is what I kind of want to go into. Do you know what you recommend I study or what classes do you recommend? And then also stalk people on LinkedIn. I know stalking is not something I should be saying on this panel, but like stalk people on LinkedIn because you'll find weird ways. Like I want, I want to go into like helping nonprofits stay afloat. So that's kind of in the middle of poli sci and business. So for me, I low-key stopped a lot of people on LinkedIn and, you know, I found out how to go about it and, you know, so I would recommend that. And again, Jenna Gosman, I think I know Career Service is doing uh, sessions on Zoom and phone. So you guys can, you know, do either one of those. So whoever asked that question, you know, do that and name your transfer schools that this is, you know, my major, this is kind of what I want to do. What advice do you have for that? So. And also, uh, also, I would uh, suggest um, that if you're interested in that field, that there are a lot of those organizations, the organizations that will be talking to us in these workshops and that are on the brochure, they're stretched very thin. You know, they would love to have volunteers and you get some exposure to it and you get, you know, you get it from their mouths about how to best prepare yourself for a field like that. I know I did that. When I was an undergraduate, I worked with um, people who had been in and out of um, you know, mental hospitals. Um, you know, and that was more a psychology thing. But, um, but yeah, for, certainly for these uh, resources, these people would really, really like some help. Um, Yvonne, did you want to add something? Oh, I was going to say, believe it or not, there actually is an ombuds um, <laughs> degree that you can get. Um, usually it's like you've mentioned, psychologists, social workers, um, that sort of background. But um, we have a professional organization that obviously always posts um, job openings. And it's really interesting to see what institutions hire ombuds. And we actually have police departments that use ombuds, universities. Um, I just saw a posting for the International Olympic Committee that's hiring an ombuds to protect the athletes during um, competition. So a uh, informal neutral place to go, you're basically a professional mediator. So it's pretty interesting work. I, I think that also, you know, you have a lot of people in, in these fields here at the, the college, you know, see if they'll be your mentor. You know, I, I know that like we have people that uh, are cadets for the police department and, you know, they want to be a police officer. And so we tell them how to, we do mock interviews to kind of help them get through the process because it gets scary and stuff mm -hmm. and you know and I'm a mentor on the men of color here at the campus as well so there's a lot of different groups you know mm -hmm. and a lot of people here are willing to help and assist you just have to ask mm -hmm. and I'm sure you'll find somebody. I also like to mention that organizations like Peace Over Violence they they offer training if you want to do some voluntary work to um, you know handle the hotline calls so that you get experience that way. And sometimes, you know, get, getting yourself out there in a voluntary way is a way that you can uh, improve and get networks so that if this was a career you wanted to work with, then you could then uh, pursue that. That also, I'm sure, be very happy, 
Peace Over Violence, um, the Rape Treatment Centre, uh, the Centre for the Pacific Asian Family would be very happy as they're coming to our, our workshops to share with, well, how do I get to work for an organisation like yours? What, what education did I have to have? What sort of degree do I have to get? What sort of experience? So use this. And if this is a way that you feel that you want to give back, that this is a career that you want to pursue, then I think this would be a fabulous program um, for, for you to, to, to join as well. I would also, I'm sorry, I would also say there's student clubs, there's um, the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, there's one for intersectional females. They're pretty good starting points because there's like-minded people, so they might have information you don't have. So again, clubs, AS, I would say just go for that, honestly. I, I saw Alexis on this, um, who is the publicity, uh, Associated Student Publicity Alexis, are you still here? <laughs> Did you want to share a bit more about um, clubs? If you're st oh, there you are. Um, yes, <laughs> hello everyone. Um, so yes, there are many clubs. Um, we are in the registration process to register um, the clubs for the semester, but we're seeing a lot of registrations and we'll soon post all the clubs available. But as John V said, there is the GSA, there is the Intersectional Feminist Society. And there's all sorts of clubs. We really want to promote leadership um, among you all. So if you want to create an event around sexual assault, sexual, um, prevent, sexual assault prevention and all of that, um, please reach out to me. I will put my email. You know, you have our full support in creating an event and finding where to become a club leader, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. Is there anybody else uh, out there that I haven't, haven't seen that would like to add information, share information at this point before I thank everybody and I let everybody go to probably the next Zoom something? Yeah, there is something in the, in the chat here. Um, we have somebody, a reporter, Kamiko, um, from the Corsair, and she just put out there, if anybody would be willing to talk about the importance of this program and their future experience for a possible story um, on, a, you know, on the leadership program, if so, send her a private message with your SMC email and contact information. So I, I mean, I guess that would mean going forward, somebody who decides to go through this program and share their thoughts. Um, is that correct, Kamiko? Okay. Did you want to unmute um, her so she can, I, so we can hear her or see her? Uh, let's see. I do not see Kamiko. Let's see. Kamiko said in the chat box, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, here she is. <laughs> So did you want to um, just share, Kamiko, you're with the Corsair, what, what the Corsair has already done in, in regard to this program? Um, basically, we made awareness that the program um, will be starting and we just wanted to do a follow-up story about um, the participants and why they feel like it's an important program and why it's important for SMC students to participate and share their uh, views and opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I believe, and Linda, you can confirm that they, ha they have done a story already uh, on um, this, this program. Has it been electronically published? Uh, yes. Actually, uh, okay, yes, yeah, she would know. Can we call? Yes, if you would like, we can share a link. Yes, please, that would be great. Okay. I think it was uh, it was like today um, posted maybe yesterday. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, maybe so. Okay, well, knowing how we are all busy, I want to thank everybody. I certainly want to thank um, my two colleagues, Alan and Linda. Putting out something like this is is like an iceberg. That what you see today um, is just the top part. So much time was spent behind the scenes this ready. The support we have had for this has been universal uh, and we couldn't do something like this without the support of the whole college, including uh, the president, Dr. Jeffrey, and the board of trustees, as well as 
as all senior staff, in particular the Vice President of HR, uh, Sherry Lee Lewis. And a real big thank you to the panel, um, uh, Chief Adams, Danilo, Yvonne and Juliana. Couldn't have had the panel discussion without them. I couldn't have winged it either because they just know too much. And, and particularly Janfi for giving up her time. Um, when, I was, when she came last year, it was, it was such an interesting experience um, when she wanted to come and find out what was happening. And then when she turned around and said, I like this, I'm going to fit, I'm going to do this myself. It was, it was really gratifying because we were piloting it. So we weren't sure how it was going to take off. And, you know, with, with, with doing it on ground was one thing. Now we're trying to do this through the virtual world. Uh, and to see so many people, I am just so, so excited. So on that note, I'm going to yeah, wait and we'll forget. We, we do not, we never forget. And we've had a lot of support from also associated students, uh, especially when we did all the on ground work last time, they supplied yeah. lunch, you know, and they, uh, yeah, bags and everything. And we wish we could do, be doing that this year as well. But yeah, associated students has been amazing with us. So, and, and for that reason, because they support this, um, we are privileged to use their logo when we have sent out information about um, this Title IX leadership program. And using that logo is, is really special and they don't, they don't give it out freely. Um, so to know that the associated students support something like this is something that is, is really pleasing to me and, I, and, and valuable to know as far as the support. So thank you. Uh, so Alex, um, Alexis, that you're on the call, thank you to you personally. On that note, I'm going to say thank you. Um, we look forward to seeing you on the 18th. And if there are any other questions during that time, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.